to that the uh, Madeshi electorate hmm. uh, rejected most of the leaders who had been there in the previous constituent assembly. Hmm. But that didn't mean that they had uh, sort of given up on their aspirations and hopes for empowerment. And what the dispensation in Kathmandu was trying to suggest hmm. was that because the leaders had been rejected, hmm. therefore the whole question of empowerment itself could be, hmm. you know, uh, revisited right. and all the commitments uh, which had been given including commitments which were given to our leaders mm. by all the visiting leaders from Nepal and uh, to the ambassador etc mm. uh, uh, that they could be sort of uh, you know um, uh, forgotten mm. and that is uh, one reason why India feels so deeply disappointed mm. that there is a sense of betrayal mm -hmm. Uh, among the Madeshis, among the Tharus, hmm. uh, certainly uh, in India also, that this was not expected from leaders uh, hmm. with whom we had had such close communication and such close contact, hmm. and from, from whom we had repeatedly received hmm. very emphatic and clear assurances hmm. that there would be an inclusive uh, constitution which would be finally attempted. Right. Right. Mr. Shah, how, how do you, uh, you know, view India's response to the political developments there? You know, in fact, uh, uh, I was going through one of your reports uh, dated 20th September where you uh, mentioned how, you know, it's being viewed as a major problem uh, by India that could lead to, you know, further conflict there. You know, I'd just like to take on what you, take on from what you asked mm. Ambassador Rajan before I come okay. to the India question. Sure. And I'd like to contest what you said that this mm. is only a problem that the leadership in Tarai mm. has and not the people. If it was not a problem that had mass support, mm. there would not have been a band that lasted over 30 days in the Tarai. Okay. We have seen mass demonstrations. Yesterday we had thousands and thousands of people mm. on the streets of Tarai towns like Birganj. Mm. And I think this is a sig sign mm. that the people themselves mm are unhappy with the constitution it's not just a small leadership of the tarai who who which is unhappy right hmm. uh, coming to your india question you no, know that was my point yeah, that, the, yeah. that the people are contesting it but not the, the leadership is, is not you know pursued it enough perhaps so, uh, you know, uh, coming to the India mm. question, I think uh, the sense that we get very mm. clearly is that India is unhappy with what has happened. As right. Ambassador Rajan said, mm. India uh, feels that there were uh, assurances that were given. Mm. Those assurances were not met. Mm. Uh, what our sources in the government uh, have told us is that this is now being viewed at the highest levels of the government, including the Prime Minister with utmost seriousness, mm -hmm. that uh, th even the Prime Minister is... I from what one gathers very upset hmm. because you know he has personally invested a lot in this relationship right. he has gone to Kathmandu twice hmm. he has tried to allay the insecurities of uh, Nepal vis-a-vis -vis Indian intentions hmm. he has almost given a blank check to the Nepali leader leadership on contentious issues at the 1950 treaty hmm. he uh, was the first one to offer generous support after the earthquake hmm. and uh, the advice that he has offered has been with good intentions hmm. yet what uh, we what India has faced in Nepal at the moment is that the, nobody is listening to Indian advice hmm. Uh, and uh, the instead, what the Kathmandu elite is doing is stoking ultra-nationalism and stoking anti-Indianism by trying to project that the entire Tarai agitation has been propped up by India when mm. this is far from the truth. The Tarai mm. agitation, as we just discussed, is a people-led right. movement on the ground. Right. So I think India is deeply upset mm. and uh, we know that in the past week itself, mm. the National Security Advisor spoke to Nepal's leaders and told them put right. off the constitution process for a while. Mm. The External Affairs Minister issued a very strong statement mm. where she said that there should have that the constitution should reflect the aspirations hmm. of all regions and all sections of society. Right. The Indian ambassador in Kathmandu categorically clarified what the statement meant and hmm. said unless Tharus and Madesis are taken on board, hmm. there will be no stability, India will not be uh, happy with it. Right. And the Prime Minister sent not just his Foreign Secretary but hmm. as his special envoy, hmm. Dr. S. Jay Shankar right. to convey this message. Hmm. And he told the Nepali leadership that look, how do you expect us to welcome a constitution hmm. which is being brought about when half your country is under curfew, the army is deployed right. and there is violence. Hmm. So despite this very strong message hmm. and India pulling out its diplomatic uh, guns, hmm. uh, Nepal did not listen. So I think there is a lot of anger here hmm. and Kathmandu will, I think, uh, you know, have to suffer the consequences, hmm. not just of not listening to India, hmm. but of not listening to its own people. Hmm. So what is happening now is that I think there is a convergence of hmm. interests of what the Tarai uh, wants hmm. and uh, of India, which is not backing 
Tarai's agenda, hmm. but which wants a stable Nepal, hmm. and which is why it, and it realizes that unless the Tarai is accommodated in Nepal's political structure, there will be no stable Nepal, hmm. and because it is right at the border, there will be a spillover effect on India. Hmm. So I think uh, that India-Nepal relations are headed for a very tough time, okay. and Kathmandu will uh, have to pay a price for this belligerence. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Ambassador Rajan, what will be the implications for India here, and and what can in India do in, in, in such a situation? I think India will have to review its um, traditional uh, engagements mm -hmm. with uh, the Nepali leadership and the kind of priorities that it has been according uh, in its engagements. You know, we used to talk about a twin pillar policy on the part of India mm -hmm. where the monarchy and the uh, system of uh, parliamentary democracy were the two pillars. Mm. It is possible that there is the beginning of a new twin pillar policy where India will have to have a policy hmm. towards the, the Madesh, towards uh, the Tarai, hmm. uh, towards people who really have no other country who would be willing to stand up for hmm. them in the larger interest of a strong and stable Nepal. Hmm. And on the other hand, it will have to continue with a with, uh, with the sustaining a relationship uh, with the government in Kathmandu because there are uh, other strategic interests involved. So I think it will be a very delicate act mm. that India will have to get into. Mm. But uh, the next few months, as uh, Prashant Jha says, uh, or even longer, could be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, frankly, you know, uh, India is now no longer dealing with a country which is a unitary uh, state. You know, if you are unhappy with the king, you could mm. send Ronan Sen as Rajiv Gandhi's emissary and explain to the king about the consequences of uh, cancelling the 1950 treaty and so on and persuade him to be reasonable. If you are not happy with uh, Prachand, mm. you could, uh, you always had a certain option uh, and so on. Mm. But today you are dealing with a full-fledged democracy where a constitution has been adopted and there are certain players who are uh, the force, main force behind that constitution. It's going to be much more difficult for India now to try and uh, leverage its assets hmm. in Nepal uh, in the sense that it would like to, which is really to have a more enlightened sense of nationalism, national interest, unity, hmm. federalism, etc. in Nepal, because that is the kind of Nepal that we've been wanting to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Nayak, is th the constitution then headed for a review eventually, you think? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, the top leaders uh, before, uh, Im immediately after the adoption of this constitution, even before that, they said that uh, this is a hmm. living document hmm. and uh, there are ample uh, chances that uh, the grievances of the marginalized groups will be accommodated through amendment. Hmm. And uh, even uh, Government of India also, um, during, uh, I mean, uh, our bilateral interactions, um, we have already requested, uh, we, we have already, I mean, uh, asked the Nepal government to uh, also accommodate all those grievances mm -hmm. uh, which are being highlighted by the marginalized groups. So, there are chances that but how far these marginalized uh, groups are, will be accommodated, this is a big question because uh, right. there is rigid position as taken by from the mar marginalized groups and the political, uh, mm -hmm. and the ruling classes. And there are so over a hundred uh, ethnic groups in Nepal. Uh, no, there are a hundred and nine ethnic groups mm -hmm. are there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, not necessarily that uh, all these groups are right. you know, demanding mm -hmm. for certain things, but mm -hmm. there are certain major uh, ethnic groups are there like uh, Madhya 